We are at the halfway mark of X-Men 97 with episode 5. The title is Remember It, but an alternate title in my opinion should be The Point of No Return because after this, there's no going back to the way things were before. This video is going to be a little bit different. I'm just going off the top of the dome, so let's just get right into it. The episode starts with a big celebration in Genosha, as its citizens welcome the X-Men, specifically Magneto, Rogue, and Gambit. While back in the United States, the other members of the X-Men are being interviewed for a special news piece covering Genosha's entry into the United Nations. It's a big happy day for all parties involved, which is a dead giveaway that by the end of this episode, we'll all be crying angry tears. And since we basically know that trauma and tragedy are dead ahead, let's go ahead and knock out some of the good, lighthearted things that this episode does really well. First off, we have the return of Nightcrawler. I love how X-Men 97 interprets Nightcrawler's character. This might just be the first time in X-Men history that he is adapted faithfully to this degree. Everyone's happy to see him. He even shakes Magneto's hand, cause it's Nightcrawler. He's just the friendliest guy in the room at all times. He starts showing Gambit and Rogue around Genosha while Magneto goes off to have a meeting. He also plays the strong wingman to Gambit. A man named Gambit. Your poker face is very poor. Hey, mind your beeswax, Furball. Didn't go ringing for no priest. It does not take a priest to see you and Rogue's souls touch in every gaze. <laughs> Ain't the touch she be looking for. Speaking of Genosha, it's just one big happy nation, wink wink. We got street vendors, we got all types of music and street performances going on with plenty of cameos from lots of different mutants that otherwise likely wouldn't make it into the cast. It's actually really beautiful to see what mutant kind can do when just left the hell alone. But it can't be all smiles and dances all episode. Back stateside, the interview is unearthing some dark sides of the X-Men. Jean Grey isn't even partaking in the interview, she's off doing her own thing, trying to sort through these memories that she still can't make sense of and nail down as her own. The stress of recent events is really taking its toll on Scott. He's trying to talk about how he feels being the team leader, but he keeps getting interrupted because I think this is more evidence that before the end of this season, Scott is going to walk away from his position as team leader. She asks him about his recent birth, but he's like, I don't have no kid. That's because he and Madeline Pryor had the child. But she starts going through the birth records of Nathan, and he just flat out loses it. He blows up on the interviewer because he feels like he shouldn't have to justify his existence as a person. Why lie? Because you're normal. Excuse me. I said because you're normal. You're ungrateful. We fight, risk our lives for you. Evil mutants, robots, crazy aliens. I gave him up. I gave him up because you can't say thank you. Because I have to stomach your questions and prove that I'm a person. It's easy to see how someone like Scott could lose their cool every now and then. I mean, just two episodes ago, Scott found out that the love of his life was actually not the love of his life. And that actually creates another love triangle on top of the two love triangles that we were already dealing with in this show. And all three of them come to a head in a very dramatic way in this episode. And honestly, more than the big plot points that are happening, this episode is about relationships. The messy, triangular relationships that make the X-Men the X-Men. While Jean is tending to her memories, Wolverine goes to check on her, and they have this talk about how Jean is being kept at arm's length from Scott because he's still dealing with the loss of his son and the fact that Madeline Pryor is Madeline Pryor. She also has her own reasons for being silent though, because she's still trying to figure out who she really is, but it's not keeping Wolverine from letting Jean know that he's still here for her. That even though there's all these clones and he's lived for hundreds of years, he's only ever seen one Jean Grey. This is when these two share a kiss. It's so abrupt, the music literally stops. Ooh, yes, give me that superhero soap opera action. I love it. And it's actually Wolverine who pulls away. She just had a moment where she quote unquote forgot the rules, but they're not going to speak about it anymore. Cut back real quick to Genosha, where Magneto is actually propositioned to be the leader or chancellor, as they call it. 
We also see that the council is made up of several colorful figures, most of whom have been villains to the X-Men. We got Sebastian Shaw and Emma Frost from the Hellfire Club. We have Madeline Pryor herself, Banshee, and Moira McTaggart. While everyone's having their debate about Magneto being the leader, Madeline is engaging in a little something else. We have this really touching scene of Scott upstairs after his blow up looking at a picture that was taken right after Nathan was born. They start having this talk about how he can see him and how even though Scott can't see color, he can make out Nathan's brown eyes and rusty brown hair. But if you notice, Jean is wearing different clothes. Cause that ain't Jean, that's Madeline. Ooh, bitch, we in for a good one. <laughs> and as the two begin to embrace and share a nice passionate kiss, the real Jean stands up and makes her presence known, kicking Madeline out of the astral plane. Scott has been having a full-blown psychic affair with Madeline prior. He loves his Jean, but he also still loves Madeline. And the two basically let each other have it. Jean blows up because of course, while Scott throws it back in her face and is like, hold up. You don't even know who you are. You don't know which memories are your memories. Is your love for me real or is that just a memory itself? But all that is interrupted when Jean has this strange reaction to something. She gets what can only be described as some type of mini psychic stroke where she actually starts to bleed from her nose. The same thing happens to Madeline later on in the episode. Now, people are speculating that this is part of an attack from a character named Cassandra Nova, who's actually an evil twin of Charles Xavier. I mean, we already know the season is gonna end with a three-parter that's called Tolerance is Extinction, so we already know we in for some serious shit. But right now, let's deal with what's going on in the present, because it is so much going on. Cut back to Genosha and Emma Frost being the messy, petty queen that she is and everyone loving it. Sorry, mine just drifted a moment. Mine drift indeed. The messiness, give it to me. Give it to me. But Magneto agrees to be the Chancellor of Genosha on one condition. Rogue must be his queen. Rogue pushes back. She does not want to go along with this, but Magneto's words are making too much sense. And so she goes back to tell Gambit the whole story. So let's you and I have this moment, dear viewer, because I've talked very little about this whole pairing. It's been easily the most divisive issue regarding X-Men 97. My evil mother was helping me with my powers said she knew a fella who could help, an associate. The man seemed nice enough, seemed to want to help. He spent weeks talking about how mutants were special, how we'd have our own cities and culture one day. He showed me that being a mutant wasn't just about my power, it could be something more. And when we realized that his electromagnetic powers protected him from my touch, other things started happening. Marvel tends to avoid putting a whole lot of ages on when this stuff happens. So some people are like, oh no, this is gross. This is disgusting because Magneto is a man who's easily in his 60s, if not 70s, and Rogue was a teenager back then. But while Disney is doing always some questionable shit, I want problems, always. I don't think they've gone that far. It's safe to assume that she was at least of legal age. And yes, the age gap is huge, but I don't necessarily think it's a matter of them getting together while she was in adolescence. And as to the whole morality of the thing, I don't think that's something that should be held against the show. These people as characters are not here to just do things that we like. They're not here to have it all together. They're written to be true human beings. While they are superheroes, and yes, while we are meant to see them and aspiring to be like them in some instances is very good, we must remember that they are still human beings. And human beings are messy. So seeing Gambit and Rogue have this heart to heart because finally we see this coming to a head. We've seen Gambit be beside himself with this whole thing all show. We've seen him have to watch Rogue and Magneto walk around doing stuff together, not even knowing what they're doing. Magneto has essentially always asserting his dominance. Gambit, your boy, has just been sitting there 
taken that shit. We've wanted to see them actually fully realize their relationship in the show for literal decades. So to see Gambit hold it together and not only hold it together and treat Rogue with so much respect and dignity and not make it a big dick measuring contest, but even be plagued to feel like he doesn't deserve her. And finally, we're here. All the expectations, every time looking at you, seeing all the things I couldn't do. Like telling Gambit the dang truth. I can't touch you, Remy. Something's a bit deeper than skin, Shia. Oh my, oh my god, it's so good! It's so fucking good! You fucking give me that soap opera shit, X-Men. And to bring it home, a lot of people have been saying the Gambit was being cucked. But his balls are intact because during this whole time, he doesn't falter. He doesn't waver. He sheds some tears, but they thug tears. He keeps his composure. Your boy Gambit, he'll be here for you. But as a friend, and that was beautiful. He still has himself, his dignity intact, which is something big for Gambit because the man mostly hates himself most of the time and can't even see himself as the hero he is because of it. Now we're getting to the big moment. We're at this big dance. Everyone's dressed to the nines. Rogue descends, looking like the Southern Belle that she is in this beautiful red dress. And she literally floats into Magneto's arms as he rises to meet her. The two have a passionate dance as Ace of Base Happy Nation plays in the background. Gambit looks from the ground as they embrace each other, but he can't watch for long. He walks away. The two share a passionate romantic kiss. And that's when Rogue flips the script. Thanks for the dance, sugar. But Remy was right. Some things are deeper than skin. So she planned on this being her moment where she says, you know what? It's time for me to go be with my man that I should have been with. It's time for Remy. But before any of that can happen, Madeline Pryor has another psychic stroke. She goes outside to clear her head and who runs up on her? None other than Cable, who she discovers is actually her son. We all knew we were just waiting for her to figure it out. So he's running in, telling everyone to turn the music off, talking about he's coming. And before he can give any information, his time device reactivates and he slides back to the future. He says, I'm sorry, mom, as he disappears. I actually heard that this was Gambit's original voice actor playing Cable, and you can really hear it in that last line. As Madeline Pryor is sitting there confused as all hell because, yay, her son's alive, but also, what the hell's coming? The festivities are interrupted by an enormous green explosion. Partygoers are flung in all directions. It's absolute chaos. This three-headed, bug-bodied kaiju sentinel rampages through Genosha. We're seeing people getting straight up disintegrated on screen. Our heroes barely make it out as Nightcrawler bamps in and teleports them away, turning so that he takes all the force from the beam, barely holding on. And as Magneto, Gambit, and Rogue begin to get their wits about them, we see that there are even more casualties. Madeline Pryor looks to be at least unconscious, if not dead, and not even Callisto, leader of the Morlocks and mutant council member, didn't make it out of this unscathed. Magneto will draw the fire of the Kaiju Sentinel while Rogue and Gambit go and bring the others to safety. So he starts flying around, just getting it to try to blast him until he gets blasted into his own statue. Or was it Charles's statue? It might have been Charles's statue. He falls into the statue and the impact causes the statue to topple over onto civilians on the ground. Magneto kneels, seeing the carnage happening around him. And he has images of the present carnage mixed into his flashbacks in the concentration camp. The surviving Morlocks are held out in a building, but they're basically waiting for death to come. Everyone except Leech, who is confident that they'll be saved because Magneto promised him that he would never have to be afraid again. And who comes in for the save as a giant sentinel head almost barrels into the building? None other than our favorite scoundrel Gambit. By the way, while all this is happening with Magneto, Rogue and Gambit are basically having a really good moment. 
not like a soft moment, but just like flying side by side each other. She's flying, he's on his motorcycle, and they just smile. Even though the world is going to hell in a handbasket around them, they're still having a good time fighting together, working together. Never much care for roulette. The Sentinel finally corners them, and it's getting ready to fire. It says, Omega Level Threat Detected, focusing all of its energy on Magneto, who is charging a force field because he has several mutants surrounding him, including the young Leech. The Sentinel fires the biggest blast it's fired during this whole ordeal. Magneto is putting all of his strength all of his power into simply keeping them alive. Rogue tries to rush over and help, but Magneto traps her and Gambit in a metal cage to keep them safe. She calls out to him, don't you dare do this, Eric, but he has to. The two share one last long engage before Magneto looks down to Leech and says in German, don't be afraid, or more literally translated, have no fear. Hab keine Angst. Omega Threat eliminated. Rogue is overcome with angry grief. She bursts out of the metal cage and flies headlong towards the Sentinel. The cinematography in this episode is second to none. The use of close ups. The way that Rogue's tears fly into the camera as we see her fly off, it was beautiful. Gambit, of course, isn't going to let his girl go out like that. He supercharges his motorcycle and rides it directly up into Rogue, getting her out of the way and making the Sentinel divert its attention. Nightcrawler and a few other survivors are all standing off on their own. The Sentinel gets ready to fire on them and that's when Gambit decides it's time for him to make his stand. He rushes the Sentinel, diverting all of its attention. He jumps into the air with his bow staff charged, ready to deliver some serious pain on this thing, and he gets stabbed, impaled, mid-jump. The Sentinel, it says, mutant threat neutralized. But Gambit is not just a mutant, and he's gonna let everyone know what his name is. The name's Gambit. Remember it. I've seen heroes sacrifice themselves more times than I care to count. But this one here, I haven't been this emotionally affected from an on-screen death since Iron Man in Endgame. We cut to the X-Mansion where news of this tragedy is hitting the airwaves. The X-Men are watching helplessly as the remains of Genosha are going up in flames, where Nightcrawler and a few other straggling survivors gather around a giant crater, in the center of which is Rogue, cradling Gambit's still body. Her final words echoing the same argument that they were having prior to the dance. I, I can't feel you. <laughs> I know the next episode we're getting is Life Death Part 2, but I don't know how it's going to play out. Storm wasn't in this episode at all, and I'm honestly glad she wasn't. Not only was there so many other things happening that needed more focus, but Storm is on her own arc right now. She gets her own story and we will see where this takes her next time. I'm uneasy. I'm hurt. And yes, yes, comic books, X-Men, everyone comes back. I know that. But the fact that they had the balls, the cojones, the ovaries, the spine, the whatever you want to call it, to kill fucking Gambit. And for him to always question himself always feel like he's just a swamp rat. He's just a scoundrel. He doesn't deserve anything. He makes the sacrificial play. Ain't been a realer hero death that hit this hard since Iron Man. It was the culmination of the greatest cinematic saga of our time and maybe of all time. But for X-Men, this is just fucking Wednesday. This is just the halfway point. 
I can't even imagine what we're going to get in those last three episodes. And Bo DeMeo has been doing the rounds on social media. He been on Twitter just like, yup, y'all ain't seen nothing yet. Wait till them last three episodes get here. I'm going to both hate and love this man by the end of the season. Tell me what you feel in the comments. Are you okay? I don't know what's coming next, but I can't wait. X-Men 97. X-Men's back. Thanks for watching and shit, pour one out for your boys Gambit and Magneto. See y'all next week.